So, well, first of all, lots of for my part, thank you very much to the organizers for, for organizing this conference and also, of course, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk uh, about this ongoing research of mine together with uh, Jan Swart. Um, so what we are basically trying to do, we are similar to what Kiara presented before. We are trying to identify more or less underlying structure that then gives rise to dualities. But in our case, we, are, we don't use this algebraic approach, but the pathways one. Uh, and this underlying structure then, it, as you might have guessed from the title, will be this monoids, this algebraic objects. So, and as you also might have guessed from the, the title, we are concentrating our work on integrating uh, integrating particle systems. Okay, perfect. That worked. So, and uh, in the context of this talk, uh, um, we we think of an interacting particle system as the following. So, as a Markov process on a this is the light, I guess yes. So, on as a Markov process uh, with values in some product state space as to the lambda where S uh, is a finite set, so a little bit different than to the two talks before, where this local state space uh, was uh, the naturals. Now we concentrate on uh, it to be finite. And in the, most, uh, in the most classical models of these processes in the contact process or the voter model, it uh, even just consists of two elements, zero and one. Um, and on, to on top or somehow beneath of this, we have a countable set, the lattice, and this will usually just be the set to the D, the integer lattice. Um, and then we assume that our, our the time evolution of uh, such an interactive particle system is given in the following uh, version, often called random re mapping representation of the generator, where we have some non-negative uh, some non-negative uh, numbers Rm. Uh, with which with which rates are some local maps uh, m applied to the current uh, configuration of our, of our process. Um, and here with local maps, uh, that is meant to be a continuous map from uh, our global state band as the lambda to itself. Uh, that also has the probability that it can at most change uh, a finite number of states. Okay, so and again, another definition of duality similar to the two we have already seen today. Uh, so we again are focusing on focusing on dualities between two uh, such interacting part uh, particle systems as defined on the previous slide uh, that can have in general uh, different local state spaces S and R, but both finite, but are defined on the same uh, lattice lambda uh, and. Uh, uh, dual, uh, with a duality, we refer to a relation, uh, relation between these two integral particle systems uh, as a function mapping from the product of these two global state spaces here in R, but also later into general objects, such that uh, for, for, e, for some fixed T greater or equal to zero, this uh, expectation does not depend on S. Uh, between zero and t, and then in particular we get this equality, which is basically the equality you've seen twice already today. That uh, if we fix some initial state of uh, the process y and evolve the process x, x, this should be the same as if we uh, fix some initial state of uh, this process x and then evolve y. So, and the question uh, we are asking as our, ourselves is how can be that in general, if you have given like a general interactive particle system, how to identify dualities to relations for it. Uh, and the, our answer or the approach we have taken is to uh, find such duality relations uh, via the set of local maps, uh, calligraphic G. So um, instead of uh, if I, or saying some duality between processes, we somehow cut this down to a duality between two maps. So one map is mapping from the global state space to itself from the first interacting uh, particle system. Uh, and M hat is then mapping from the other global state space to itself. Uh, and then we say that they are dual with respect to some duality relation also, like denoted, usually denoted during the talk as uh, psi, uh, mapping from the product space and some arbitrary space V for the moment. Uh, if this relation holds. And the idea is then that we, with such a relation, 
we can then uh, define both processes on the via the same graphical representation via the same uh point process so that uh, this uh, this duality relation then holds okay but of course the next question is then okay we want to find this dual maps but how do we identify these dual maps uh, and the idea for this is to put some additional structure then on the the state space or first in particular or onto the local state space this finite set s uh, and for this we introduce this monoids so i don't know if you remember monoids from your basic algebra lessons but basically they are really simple objects so they are just semi-groups so some set uh, equipped with some associative binary operation on it that have a neutral element usually denoted by zero. And for two uh, such monoids, S and T, with some arbitrary uh, operations defined on it, we then say as usual in algebra that a homomorphism between two such objects is a, a map that respects uh, the operation in this sense. Uh, and that maps the neutral element of the first monoid to the neutral element of the second one. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I guess you you could say that like this, but like in the usual basic algebraic setting, you usually talk. Uh, no, I mean. But like the semi-groups are not like maps that are just like first of all think about them as like points like and then we can we can connect two points by this addition or by this operation and then like the neutral map is the or the neutral element is the one that gives back the other element when you operate it with another one. yes exactly because later on we will talk about commutative but yes okay and uh like in the following we then want to talk about uh, the set of all homomorphisms between two such monoids we denoted by this calligraphic h uh, and the first important thing to note is that this again is a is a monoid or especially it's a, a commutative monoid if t is a commutative monoid where we equip this space of homomorphisms uh, with the with the operation of t in a point point by sense. Okay, and with this uh, with this in mind, we can first of all define uh, some duality of finite commutative monoids uh, in this sense. So we assume that we have three finite commutative monoids, uh, and then similar to before. Uh, some function mapping from the product of S and R to T. And we say then that S is T dual to R with duality function Psi, if this four condition uh, hold. Uh, yeah, so basically we recover like the, the monoid of all homomorphisms. If we fix either one, one Y in R or an X in S. And uh, if we also fix, if we have like two different X uh, and then uh, this duality function coincides for all y and r. That already implies that x, that the x uh, coincide in S, or and vice versa with roles of S and R switched. Uh, and this turns out to be a good definition, or well, we've defined it uh, also in this ways, mainly because the, the following small result. Um, so, if we have two finite commutative monoids S and T, then we can set in the spirit of, uh, of Banach spaces, we can set like S prime to be the monoid then of all homomorphisms from S to T and S, uh, and S double prime we define to be uh, the, the monoid of all homomorphisms from the homomorphisms to T again. Um, and with these definitions, then uh, one can show that uh, S is T dual to S prime with duality function that just uh, given uh, between X and some function H as uh, X applied to H. Um, this, is a, this gives a duality uh, relation if S uh, is isomorphic to S double prime uh, 
with respect to this uh, homomorphism from S into double prime, which is basically the natural uh, homomorphism you also have in the theory of uh, Banner spaces. Uh, and also each duality between, between finite commutative mod monoids arises in this way. And this then allows us in our first paper that's on the archive for almost a year now to, to compute all this uh, duality re relation between finite monoids up to a somehow reasonable size of the monoids because afterwards there are like too many to uh, yeah, really do anything with this. So the idea is just we collect uh, all commutative monoids up to like these four elements. Um, then we compute this, this monoid of ho uh, homomorphisms between S and T more or less, more or less by brute force using a computer just checking for each function this, of course, there are only finite functions, so you can check for each of them easily if they are homomorphisms, and then you uh, save them, and then you check to which of the other monoids that they are isomorphic to. Um, and that's basically what this says. So we, uh, this way we identify all triplets of commutative monoids with at most four elements, uh, such that uh, this uh, isomorphic relation holds. Um, yeah, and then using this previous short result, then uh, one has to have that uh, R is isomorphic to S prime uh, and HRT is isomorphic to S double prime. And this uh, definition from the previous slides gives uh, this duality function. And also because all these dualities arise in this way, this guarantees us to find all dualities between commute monoids with at most four elements. So this was the basic strategy in our first paper. And maybe because most of you, I guess, are not used to work with monoids here for your interest there. Uh, I copied you uh, a finite a sequence of the number of, uh, of commutative monoids up to isomorphism. So you can see here the zero, one, two, two, three, fourth element is 19. So there are just 19 monoids with four uh, elements. And afterwards, like the numbers are increasing quite a bit. So it's not so nice to like list all, uh, all this, uh, and this duality relations. And maybe a side note that I saw when preparing the slide. So this last element, this 11 million something for monoids with 10 elements was just recently in February of this year added to this list. So there in the algebra community, there's active research or active computation still going on to compute like these numbers, which uh, I found quite interesting. But okay, let's uh, have maybe a short look at what, what uh, how this monoids look like. So um, with two elements, we have two uh, monoids that uh, in all of this, we, uh, we make the uh, convention that we write the neutral element as zero. So of course, for the two elements, like these two entries here in this table are fixed because the zero has to be neutral. So we have, we have like only one degree of freedom here, either one applied to one is one or one applied to one is zero. Um, and yeah, of course, we can interpret uh, monoid M1 as like zero, the usual zero one with like the maximum operation, and then M2 as usual zero one with addition model two, if you want that. But there are also other other uh, representations of this monoid. So of course, you can also switch the roles of zero and one, and then use as the operation the usual product in R. Or you can like here change this to one minus one, and then take the, also the usual multiplication now. Um, yeah, maybe a quick note for like these are the ones with three elements. So you may recognize that M7 is just uh, addition modulo three. So somehow a generalization of M2. Uh, yeah, this is also somehow the generalization of M1, just taking the maximum operation for zero, one, two. Uh, and this one we can also express in, in the reals. Uh, equipped with the usual with multiplication. If uh, zero is again one, one is minus one, and this is like the same as we had here. And then two uh, is the zero, the somehow absorbing element that if you apply a zero to another element, you just get zero back with usual multiplication. Okay. So, well, up until now, we have just defined this duality between monoids, but like basically we are interested in these maps that we want, that we are using in the definition of our generators of this interactive particle systems. Uh, 
But uh, there, for this, we have this also another short result uh, saying that if you have such a, such a duality relation between such two finite monoids S and R, as we had before, then uh, a map mapping from this S to itself has a dual map M hat uh, mapping from R to itself with respect to this duality function coming from this duality between the monoids, uh, if and only if it is a homomorphism from S to itself. And this dual map, if it exists, is unique and satisfies uh, also that it is a homomorphism from R to itself. So we are off to a good start. We have this unique dual maps. But uh, the little thing we have to fix that we are for now just looked at this local state space, this finite uh, local state space, but for our generator for our generator, we of course needed globally on this uh, on this set S to the lambda, this even uncountable set, right? Okay, and for this uh, we have to to introduce some further notation. So also the another smaller issue that we want to talk about continuous maps, so we need some topology uh, put on top of this monoid structures. So we say that some, some monoid that does not have to be finite anymore uh, is a topolo topological monoid if it is equipped with uh, some topology such that uh, this map uh, mapping from the product space of M to itself, giving just uh, this operation back between two elements is continuous when uh, the product of M with itself is equipped with the product topology. Okay, and with this definition, we also adapt this definition of H, which previous just were the, the, the monoid of all homomorphisms between two uh, monoids. But if we are talking about uh, topolo topological monoids, then we wanted to denote all continuous homomorphisms between the two sets. Uh, and in the following, we, we make the, the convention that each finite uh, monoid or even each countable monoid we just equip with the discrete topology. So then, of course, each uh, of the of maps between these such objects are automatically continuous, and then we don't have like so this then gives a consistent definition that doesn't need a, any contradiction with the one we had before. Um, and okay, then. The next thing to note is that if you have some finite monoid M, uh, then the M to the lambda, where lambda is this countable lattice, is still a monoid. Uh, we can, with uh, the neutral uh, element being equal to the configuration that everywhere has the neutral element, and again with uh, the operation inhabited of, F, of M applied uh, component wise. So we can, this will then, of course, be our topological monoid we are talking about here. And this one then we uh, naturally equip with the, with the product uh, topology. But also we will need uh, some sub monoid of this monoid in the future, uh, this finite sub monoid, which we define to be ju just all elements of this product monoid that are almost everywhere equal to the neutral element. And we will see in two slides why, why this will become important. Um, but first, we can now uh, can now copy more or less our definition uh, from the world of finite monoids to the world of uh, topolo topological monoids uh, by just yeah copying the the, the definition you've seen before, uh, where note that we have now uh, using like here somehow a different age with the uh, continuous uh, mono, uh, homomorphisms. But all the rest of the definition stays the same. And the other one then is a special case of this definition because we use this convention to just equip all finite uh, monoids with the discrete topology. Um, okay. So, and uh, then uh, the, the nice result comes into place. So uh, we assume that, again, as always, we have like, three commutative finite monoids. And we assume that uh, S is T dual through R with duality function Psi as we had before. Uh, and then we define uh, this bold Psi between somehow the product spaces as just taking the product over all elements in our lattice lambda of this local duality function Psi. 
But of course, we have to be somehow careful here because in general, this operation can be anything. For example, it can be addition module two. So if you have like infinite things you want to take uh, addition module two over, then you don't get uh, like a, a well-defined definition. And for this reason, we here just allow this uh, Ys to be the finite one of R to the lambda. But of course, you also can switch rules of S and R that would be trivial. And with this uh, definition of this old psi, uh, we have this following nice results. So just if we have that S is T dual to R with duality function normal psi, then the product space S to the lambda is T dual to R lambda finite with uh, this with this bold psi duality function. Um, and then going back to this question of the maps, uh, for time reasons, uh, I didn't want to go into too much detail there. But basically, one can show that if you have some map mapping from this product space S to the lambda to itself, uh, that is a local homomorphism, then we can represent it with an infinite matrix who, which, whose elements are these homomorphisms from the local state space S to itself um, in such a way that when we like look at uh, this m at some i in lambda, then we just sum over the rows or the columns of this infinite matrix representation, roughly speaking. Um, and then uh, we can show that its uh, unique dual map with respect to this bold psi can be constructed by just replacing all these matrix elements that are these uh, homomorphisms from S to S that we know that they have a unique dual map. So we replace all these elements with the unique dual elements, and this then gives a representation for uh, for the mate for the matrix of this dual map uh, from R lambda finite to R lambda finite. And we also have to uh, like transpose them. I wanted to skip all these technical details and this matrix stuff. But the take-home message is that it's if we have a local homomorphism, we can easily represent it in this way, and we can easily compute this dual function. Okay, what's this? Okay, so and then um, the idea, as mentioned before, is when we have like this duality between these maps, we can easily then uh, construct a duality between the corresponding uh, interacting parting systems, um, and we can even do this in a in a pathwise sense uh, with this uh, same with the same Poisson point process as I was mentioning beforehand. So. Um, we define two two generators j j no g and j g and g hat um, as before where like for g now all our maps should map all our maps in g should be uh, uh, yeah this local local maps and local yeah, local homomorphisms of course in the setting we had before um, and for then for g hat. We just uh, take here the corresponding dual maps I was talking just last slide about. Um, and then with just assuming as before that uh, S, R, and T are finite commutative monoids, so that S is T dual, T dual to R with duality function psi, as before, we define G and G hat as rough. Uh, then okay, we have to assume some standard, some some ability condition that I didn't put here because it's fairly standard and not so interesting. Uh, then if these two processes are started in independent initial states, we can fix some capital T and we can almost surely construct uh, uh, the processes X with generator G and the process, oh, here should be a Y of course, uh, Y with generator J hat, G hat in such a way that for every T which in this interval between zero and capital T, uh, the random variables X T and X type capital T minus lowercase t are independent. And we have that uh, this function mapping from this interval into this duality function uh, is constant. And also here's some, some minor technical detail that we have like to use the cut, cut luck mod, uh, modification of the cut luck uh, interacting particle system here, which can, comes from looking downward in time instead of looking upward in time. Um, yeah, so this is the main result, and it, let's look at uh, some some examples. 
So as you remember from before, we have uh, with two monoids with two elements, we have two different ones. We have this one that corresponds to taking zero one with the maximum operator, and we have this one corresponding to zero one with addition addition module two. Then one can show that both of these monoids are also M1 is M1 dual to itself, and M2 is M2 dual to itself, uh, both with the, the same uh, local duality function that just corresponds in taking the product in this representation in R. But then the global duality function look different. If we, because like recalling this definition of both psi that I labeled with one before, uh, we have to, uh, to take the product with respect to the operation in this original or in this in this monoid in which we map to. So these are in both cases, the original ones here in these cases. Uh, so in this case, this here's the maximum operator. And in this case, it's additional uh, addition module two. So they the global duality functions look different. And these are exactly the two most used uh, duality function in the theory of interacting particle systems, at least in the interacting particle system in the way I defined them on my first slide. So this is uh, called the additive duality function, and this is called the cancellative duality function. So our first nice uh, result we get out of, out of our theory is that we can, uh, we can, we have like the two most used duality functions as special cases of our abstract duality constructing with this monoids and so on. And um, then uh, with this approach I mentioned to you uh, some slides ago, we can also find five new, somewhat new, new, let's say, duality function between monoids of three elements and 15 additional ones with monoids between four elements. That didn't fit the slide, unfortunately. Um, so maybe here some quick com comments to them. Um, so this one, as you might see between M7, so we call that M7 was the monoid corresponding to addition module three. And you quickly check that this, uh, this local duality function corresponds to taking uh, mu multiplication module of three. Uh, and this is also a general thing that when you have a finite field even, then you can construct a uh, duality function in this way. And also in our uh, first paper, we mentioned uh, instead of taking a finite field, uh, taking uh, like a finite semi, sem semi ring, then you get uh, this kind of duality function that were more or less already known before our approach. Uh, this also is interesting. This uh, M from M, or this is also somehow, or this is also known. Let's uh, put it like this this psi four mapping from M4. M4 was this uh, zero, uh, one, two equipped with the maximum operator, which is a so called order theoretic lattice. And for such order theoretic lattices, uh, Jan, together with Anja Swart a couple of years ago, they wrote a paper examining. Examin 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 uh, such uh, dualities between these objects, uh, and they they always map into M1 and take on uh, the duality function that's like the indicator of, uh, okay, here it's one minus the indicator that X is smaller or equal to Y. So these type of duality functions are also known, but we can again treat them in a unified framework using this one way it's representing. Okay, maybe it's quick word to this here. You can also see that it also can happen that we have different monoids here, this M5 monoid and this M6 monoid that are dual to each other. So this can also happen that happens more often when you consider also these dualities between monoids of four elements. Okay, some 20 minutes I think I have, that's perfect. Because now I want to uh, look at an application of all this uh, abstract theory of all these abstract dualities. Um, so, oops, this was the wrong button. So again, uh, going back to this uh, set zero one, we have these two monoids corresponding to uh, defining the maximum operator. This was this M1 and the addition, uh, addition module two, which I want to denote by this circled plus. Uh, and then using uh, this, uh, these, these operators on the set, we can define 
and uh, infection maps mapping then from our global space. So we take here our lattice lambda to equal uh, ZD as is usual. Um, so this global infection function we can define for both uh, this maximum operator and additional modulo two uh, in this way that we have an infection from individual I to individual J by just adding the local state of uh, individual I to the local state of individual J, where addition has to be interpret interpreted uh, in with respect to, to this operator in both cases. And then we can define a death map, just saying that the death at I just replaces the local state of individual I with the neutral element. So just zero. Uh, and this definition, oh no, well, with these two maps, we can define formal generators, G, G maximum and G additional modulo two uh, in the following way. So we apply each of these infection maps between neighboring individuals I and J in our set to the D uh, with rate lambda. And we apply this, all these death maps at each individual, uh, at each point of our lattice with rate delta. Uh, and then for, for our maximum operator, this then gives back the famous contact process on set D. And if we uh, use this, uh, this addition module two, this gives back the so-called annihilating branching process that we reframed in our recent paper as, as the cancellative uh, contact process between with, because of this similarity to the contact process and because uh, it was proven that uh, the cancellative contact process or annihilating branching process is self-dual with to respect to this cancellative uh, duality function you've seen before uh, in comparison to the contact process, which is self-dual with respect to this additive uh, duality function you saw, you've seen before. Okay, so this is all well known. Uh, what, what we want to do next is to, or what, what's, of course, you can somehow couple these two processes, right? Because uh, if you start in the same state and you apply the same maps to bo both of them, then the contact process with, will have at each local state, it will be at least as high as the, as the cancellative contact process because these infections, they somehow uh, coalesce for the contact process, but they annihilate for the annihilating uh, contact process. Uh, the analyzing branching process or cancellative contact process. So we can uh, yeah, couple them in a natural way. And we want to generalize this somehow by defining a, a so-called double contact process, or we framed it as a double contact process by taking the local space to be the product of two uh, of zero one with itself. So we have this process consists of two parts. And the first part, first coordinate should behave then like a usual contact process. And the second one as this cancellative contact process. So this is the idea. So we define some, some more infection maps and some death maps where either we have an infection for both of the processes or just for one. And we have deaths either for both of the processes or just for one. And with this, like analogously to before, we define some big formal generator that applies all of these six maps you see here with different rates. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, and uh, regarding to the, to this uh, to this coupling I mentioned before, you see if we uh, if we set um, these uh, yes this additional this rate uh, lambda circle plus and uh, 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 and which one is it? This one, uh, no, yes, delta delta maximum to zero. Then uh, this this process will behave in this way because uh, if we apply both this is maps to both of the processes as before, they we they retain this uh, monotonic ordering. And I mean, if we apply additional infections to to the contact process, then there will just be more infected particles and we similarly if we apply more deaths only to to the cancellative contact process also the number of uh, particles in the can cancellative contact process is just reduced so if we in this special case that this and these rates are zero we retain we get back this coupled uh, process um, 
And if we have that, like both the usual lambdas, lambda, the usual lambda, and the usual delta are equal to zero, then of course they behave in a, in a, uh, independently from each other the process because these maps are uh, applied independently. So there's somehow a wide variety in uh, their dependency structure according to how we chose choose our our, our parameters. Um, <clears throat> okay, and we want to study this process, of course, using our theory of our monoid <coughs> sorry uh, monoid dualities. So first of all. Uh, not so surprisingly, we uh, equip this uh, this set zero one product with zero one uh, with the product operator of uh, our of the maximum operator with the addition model two operator. That gives then this this addition table for this new <coughs> sorry uh, um, for this product operator. Um, then it's straightforward to check that uh, this indeed gives a commutative mon monoid with now four elements, uh, with which has a neutral element, just uh, the neutral element, so zero in both coordinates. Um, then with this, uh, with the idea of writing these maps in this uh, <coughs> matrix structure I mentioned before, it's easy to check that all the six maps I introduced on the previous slides are indeed local homomorphisms from um, now the product space, so this this I, this monoid I define to be S, and then product S with <coughs> sorry uh, to S Z to the D. Um, and of course, what I was also already mentioning before is that we can represent the, both this monoids M1 and M2 in the reals equipped with the usual product, uh, and this other monoid M M5 I was also talking about is. Uh, is then isomorphic to another sub monoid of R equipped with the usual product, uh, where, <coughs> sorry, where, uh, um, where these two are sub monoids of, right? So it is somehow new, new, uh, natural to, uh, to, to conjecture that uh, this product monoid S I defined on the last slide is then a self dual to itself with uh, is this uh, one minus one zero self dual to itself with respect to somehow the product of the two duality functions here before. So yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that, was, that was necessary. Thank you very much. <laughs> So what we do is we uh, transform this uh, previous additive and cancellative duality function now taking values into this other monoids, these sub monoids of R equipped with the usual product uh, by just applying like this isomorphism between the, uh, these two uh, monoids. And then we can define the product, uh, product, the psi product, just as the usual product, because now the operation is here, the usual product. Uh, between these two, and then one can easily show that uh, this product S indeed is, like I was saying, this one minus one zero product dual to itself with duality function side product. And then we can use our usual machinery by uh, uh, defining this bold psi product as just taking uh, the product uh, over all sides in set D. And this product now is really the product because here our operation in this monoid is the usual product in R. So we can write this in the usual way and not with some arbitrary circled X. Okay, and having this duality, we can, we can prove, uh, we can really apply this duality function in a nice way, saying that if we have uh, now this double contact process just shortly denoted as 2CP with some parameters, that uh, satisfy these two conditions, just saying that neither the contact process in the first coordinate nor the cancellative contact process in the second coordinate, uh, that neither of both of their parameters are zero because then they just don't evolve during time, right? Um, uh, under these conditions, we say, that, or we can conclude that this process X has uh, an invariant law new that is uniquely char uh, characterized by this following uh, relation. And here, note that we really are applying this duality because in this 
integral, we integrate with respect to this x. But on the right hand si side, we are looking at uh, the uh, extinction probability started at, the, at this y here on this one, the other part. And this holds for all y in the finite submonoid of this calligraphic S, so S to the set to the D. And moreover, and more very importantly, uh, if X is started in some shift invariant in initial law concentrated on S mix, which just are these elements of S that don't have like the constant zero configuration either in the first nor in the second coordinate, then we already know that we converge weakly uh, towards this uh, measure new. Uh, okay, and here one important part of why this was working uh, was uh, the so-called informativeness, or the, we coined it somehow the informativeness of this duality function, uh, meaning that it really characterizes uh, the distribution of this process, which was like the first line. Um, so in general, we say that the family of functions are distribution det determining. Uh, if for two random variables, knowing the expectation of fi x and fi x prime, that they are equal for all functions in this family, then they are already equal in distribution. Uh, and then we say that a duality function, both size and formative, if uh, these type of functions are distribution determining. Um, and uh, one convenient result uh, you get by just applying a stone wire stress argument is as long as our, of our monoid T in which we map in the usual setting uh, is isomorphic to some sub monoid of uh, complex numbers equipped with the usual product, then this duality function already is informative. So this was the case we had for this side product, as you remember, because this was, it was mapping into one minus one zero equipped with the usual, um, with the usual product in R. So <coughs> to, Excuse me, to quickly summarize. Um, so, this monoid dualities allow one to treat uh, several known uh, dualities in a unified framework, as we have seen, like this classical, additive, cancellative, but also uh, this uh, coming from this uh, order theoretical lattices uh, studied by Jan and Anja Sturm some five years ago. Um, it is easy to compute using a computer so all of this uh, monoid duality is relation as we have done in our paper. Um, moreover, it's easy to check if some given uh, intaking particle system has such a duality, because we can easily check if a map is a local homomorphism. Um, and then the dual process is easy to compute by just uh, changing this, this matrix in the representation. Uh, but the slight disadvantage is, as you uh, might have seen that like generally this duality function don't, don't even map into R. So first of all, it's not clear to how to compute expectation in such spaces, of course. And apart from this also in general, not clear if they have this nice property of informativeness. So if they really characterize, characterize uh, the law of the process. And with this, I think I'm pretty good in time. And uh, this was my last slide. So. Thank you very much.